Oh, uh, Madeline, Madeline, I think you're, you're mute. You're mute. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. My name is Madeline, and I am the president of Pre-Med CC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization is to create an online platform for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. You know how challenging it is to find guidance and mentorship is, especially in the middle of a global pandemic. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to everyone. We realize that finding guidance in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation students, people that lack the financial resources, or those that just don't know anyone in the medical field. And one of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do them from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific time and on Saturday mornings from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Um, all of our sessions are uploaded to our YouTube channel, so if you miss them, don't worry. And our sessions end with the Q&A panel where any questions that you have can be put in the Q&A section, and then our speakers will be able to answer them. After you've attended our event, you can log into our website and complete the quiz, which has questions pertaining to today's session. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you've attended the session today. And students that attend all of our sessions can receive a Pre-Med CC Scholar Award for the hours of mentorship that they have completed. If you wanna stay connected with our events or tell your pre-med friends that are struggling to find mentorship about Pre-Med CC, all of our social media handles are at Pre-Med CC. Thank you very much. I'm gonna hand this over to Trinity who's going to introduce our speakers for today. Hi everyone, I'm gonna introduce our speakers for today. So today we are honored to have Vanessa Nava and Dr. Alessandro Bailetti. Vanessa attended Santa Rosa Junior College and then transferred with a full ride scholarship to UC Berkeley, earning a BS in nutrition and toxicology, physiology and metabolism in 2019. After graduating, Vanessa spent two and a half years performing public health research related to skin cancer prevention and management and diversity in medicine while also being involved in her community as a Sonoma County Mental Health Board District Representative. Vanessa is now starting her medical education at Stanford School of Medicine. Dr. Alessandro Bailetti is a, is a geneticist by passion and training. Alessandro was born in Peru, but later moved to Florida where he attended Pensacola Junior College. He then transferred and graduated from Cornell University with a Bachelor's of Science, followed by a PhD from New York University. He is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Stanford University and a community college advocate. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Trinity, for the introduction. Thank you, Madeline, for, for the invitation. Hi, Vanessa. Nice seeing you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. I'm so um, just, it's a Saturday, so first of all, everyone that's here, um, that is pre-med, like, amazing, because that already shows that um, you're gonna, that you're gonna have a bright future, especially that you're here on a Saturday morning. Um, so yeah, we're excited to discuss the Jack Can't Cook Foundation Scholarship, which we both uh, received. I do have a slideshow deck, if I can share my screen. Um, Alessandra, if you want to do that. Yeah, go ahead. I'll chime in as we go. Yes. Yeah, you have access, so go for it. Okay. So you guys can see this. I'll just keep it on the screen. Okay. So. We'll just get started with this first slide which is just the goals of this program slash why, in addition to getting the money, um, like why you should apply for this um, scholarship and like what Alessandra and I can discuss, um, we'll discuss like what we've received out of it um, in addition to the money, of course. So um, Alessandra, if you wanna um, discuss part of that and like the goals of Jack Can't Cook for us as students. So, um so Jack and Cook was established in early 2000s after the death of um, Jack and Cook. Um, he was a, a philanthropist, a businessman. Um, you know, he had good things and bad things like any person, but um, his uh, endowment was focused on helping people who had the potential 
to um, go on and have successful careers, but do not necessarily have the financial support like many of us. I mean, I don't know about Vanessa, but my family, we barely made $30,000 when I finished community college. And even though I had a scholarship to go to state school, um, it, it, you know, you, you always want a little bit better. And the city schools are fine, don't get me wrong, I'm not an elitist, but, um, you know, I didn't want to get into loans, even in the city schools, they cost money. So um, that's personally how um, I ended up applying for the, um, the, the scholarship. Now, uh, in my years, and yes, uh, it sounds like I'm like 90 years old when I say that, um, I, um, I got a scholarship in 2009 and they will give us $30,000, up to $30,000 a year to go to any, uh, any four-year college. Um, so personally, I was very lucky because um, uh, and the school that I decided to go to was Cornell. Um, and Cornell had this, um, this thing called meat-based grant that we can talk more about it later if you wish. But um, needs by grants is pretty much use the idea that if you get into school and your family earns um, anything below an, an a certain amount, you should be able to go to that school with little um, uh, financial need. So um, personally, the Jack and Coop Foundation uh, didn't really give me the money that I needed to go to school. They gave me the support, the... the um, the push that I needed to go to a very um, competitive school that, I was, that, that is Cornell. Um, at the same time, the school gave me a community of scholars, of like-minded people. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes in my family, I'm the, uh, the odd person out. Um, I'm one of the few scientists in my family, if any. Um, I'm not a businessman. Most of my family like are into business, making money. Um, so I'm always the the the, the weird dude. And in my with people in my um, with people in in the foundation, I didn't feel that way. It was a, a group of people that respected each other, uh, liked each other for somehow from the get go, and supported each other. Uh, morally, uh, personally, you don't know how many times I have slept in other people's couch from the foundation, other scholars' couches. You don't know how many couches, I, I, how many people have slept in my couch. So um, we're a very supportive uh, system of, of, of like-minded people. And like-minded people, regardless of your background, regardless of what, you're, um, what you want to do in the future, you tend to uh, help each other. So uh, one of my best friends is an English major um, who is 70 years old now. Um, I met her when she was in her late 50s and now she has a PhD from England. So um, you cannot get more, uh, 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 like it cannot be more a part of who you are, you know, of all, at least of who I am, you know, a, a white older woman, who is an English major and uh, went to England. I mean, you know, <laughs> so, uh, but we're really good friends. So uh, that's my point. Um, we are really, really close-knit group of people. I always tell that um, regardless of how much the foundation can support you financially, your social capital, um, that, that, that people that you know grows immensely. Um, and one of those people that I met was Vanessa a few years ago. And even though we have seen each other very few times, uh, we support each other, we help each other. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's gonna be the same uh, when any one of you uh, get this scholarship. I don't know if I mentioned all the points. Are you yeah, from? I think that's basically was it. So um, you got all the great like points of Jack Kent Cook. Essentially, um, so when I applied, um, one thing that I'll say and suggest to all of you is I really limited myself to apply 
um, to certain schools and not too many private schools, what the program wants is for you to not do that. They want you to apply to, like Alessandro did, just go for it, apply for the private schools, apply for out-of-state schools, and they will be there to support you at these um, schools that at, when I was applying did not believe I could get into. Um, I did get into Cornell actually, that decided UC Berkeley, but I also didn't apply to any other private universities. Um, I don't, I loved UC Berkeley though. So I'm happy that that happened, um, but they do want you to not limit yourself in that way and um, support you at wherever you go, whatever institution you end up attending. Um, and as Alessandra said, you meet students from literally all over the world doing so many different majors and you never know they like have a lot of startups and um, founders of like amazing organizations and I literally have contact with them and can if I wanted to they're sometimes like hey I need someone to help me with this project and the connections are just incredible so um, in addition to the money you get um, this like social capital as Alessandra said so okay um, I am sorry, what it like moves really quickly. Um, okay, one, I'm gonna exit the big screen because it's not letting, I'm so sorry. Um, okay. So yeah, as we said, with continuing support, um, like even today, even though we completed our undergraduate uh, degree, since then we've still have that network of support with students from all over the world. If I were to go right now to New York, for example, I'll send them a message on our Facebook group or we also have our own website and I could be like, can I stay on someone's couch for this weekend? And someone will respond. As Alessandro has said, he's um, been in that situation and has had that support from um, students um, all over the state, nationwide and worldwide. And you also get counselors that help you. So in undergrad, I had a counselor that helped me um, plan out um, once I transferred what that would look like for my next step. So for me, it would be medical school. So then how would it um, planning that just like big picture with a counselor was super helpful. Um, so now we see, you guys see the eligibility um, slide here. So we're getting to like the questions y'all have. Um, so for eligibility, you have to be enrolling or you have to be applying to start at a four-year institution, fall 2022, as you see here in the third bullet point. So that means that you'll be applying right now or right, I believe that's um, when students start applying right now in the fall. Um, and so that's, so what helps is that if you do this application, um, it kind of, it's through the Common App. So it helps you kind of go through things that are very similar to your application for four-year colleges. So there's some overlap. Um, also, you should have a GPA of 3.5 or above. I saw in the questions that, um, is this need-based or merit-based? They do look at um, financially. So let me, um, th there are a few questions here about the uh, university elig elig eligibility. Yeah. And even though it has been a while since I applied, the rule back then was that if you had more than 12 credit hours of a four-year college in your transcript, you're not legible anymore. So in other words, if you finish one semester or were you a part-time student a couple of years, um, you might not be eligible for this anymore. This is really aimed for people who are ready to transfer that, but they have not transferred yet. So you need to be very, um, very careful uh, about the need-based grant that I mentioned. Uh, so this, the, the Jack and Co Foundation is not a need-based grant. So what need-based grants are, are usually uh, aimed for people that need the, the financial support, period, um, regardless of your uh, academics. And usually this is at the university level. 
Um, so in other words, if you get into school, you should go to that school. And each school has different levels. A lot of these schools that have need-based grants are usually um, uh, big universities like Stanford, Cornell, uh, Harvard, Princeton. Um, but each, each of those universities have different el eligibility um, characteristics, you know? Um, like for example, at Cornell, I think it's like $60,000 or $68,000 or less that your family have to make to be eligible for it. However, at Stanford, it's like 120 thousand so each school has a uh, different eligibility uh, to apply to the for this scholarship do you have to come from a low income can you come from a middle class family that's a really good question and i'm sorry vanessa i'm i'm stopping you <laughs> in the middle of your presentation i just wanted to make sure we get these questions answered um so no, you don't have to be from a low income, but you need to show the need of the support and your um, your potential. So um, it is not a it is not a, a scholarship only aimed for, um, for 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 financial needed people, but you do need to show uh, a need. I mean, even if it's like. 10%, 20%, I don't know exactly the... So the can, uh, let me just add something. According yes. to the U.S. Department of uh, Labor, middle income is considered 43000 to $130,000. Um, most of the private schools are uh, equal to that amount of money. So if a middle income family, that's 43000 I think is for a family of three, 130 is, I think, a family of five or six. So, um, so unmet need and fine and and so middle income or, you know, it's a very, um, it's a sliding scale. But also, someone in California, middle income is very different than someone in exactly. Kansas. Exactly, 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 and that's why the the scholarship doesn't really have, and unlike. GPA um, uh, 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 eligibility, like a 3.5, um, there isn't really um, a, a requirement of financial uh, need uh, at this level. Uh, if you feel like you can use this scholarship, if you feel like you can be successful at a four-year college and you have high levels of, of uh, potential, you should apply, even if you think that your family is making uh, a decent amount, because as as you been mentioned, um, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in California is like nothing in like, I mean, other way, other way around, sixty thousand dollars in Kansas is like nothing in California. So um, even though you you may live really well in Kansas, right? So yeah, um, I, I attended a summer session at a four year university. I'm transferring to in the fall. The university is on a quota system that's not qualifying me. So most likely what is gonna disqualify you is the fact that you are already transferring to a university more than um, the classes that you took. Uh, if you didn't have enough, if you still have low levels of credits, like you know, less than 12, um, but you haven't transferred yet, that's what you want. Um, if you want to still apply for it, you know, you could take a semester off or a quarter off and, and try to apply. I do not recommend to stop your education because of a scholarship a deadline, um, but that's up to you. Um, I, I hope I am answering that question. Um, Again, uh, am I eligible if my first semester of a university is in this hall? It all depends if you want to continue. Once you continue, you're not eligible anymore. So you really need to think about the deadlines. This, this workshop, I think, is more mostly aimed for people that are still in community colleges and transferring within the next six to nine months. I mean, if you're transferring now, then 
it's gonna be it was gonna be harsher. You will have to talk directly to them. And one thing that I want you all to remember is that uh, me and Vanessa, um, we're, we're, we're so happy to be here to answer these questions, but we're not uh, admissions or uh, application specialists for the foundation. So a lot of the questions that you may have, um, they might be better aimed to the foundation and they're really good at answering questions. So uh, use FYI, we cannot answer any questions. Sorry, Vanessa, do you wanna continue? No, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Alessandro. Um, we'll continue to answer the questions um, as we continue then. Um, we can also do a Q&A at the end. Um, that's typically how we do it. So okay. if you want the entire presentation and then at the end, we'll uh, present all the questions to you. Yeah, too. We might answer some of the questions on the way. Um, I know, I know. I tend to use go with the flow, but yes, whatever, whatever works best. Um, okay, so selection criteria, um, they, as we did say, they do look at financial need, but um, that can mean different things, and they do look at a lot of other um, things, such as, again, having a 3.5 GPA or higher, and for them especially, they really like to see people that um, have a passion for, um, for something, and are leaders within that uh, passion and can demonstrate that throughout their um, through what they've done and in their application, obviously. Um, so, Alessandra, do you want to add to that and maybe give an example of something you did that you talked about? So, um, like I, like we have mentioned before, that this the scholarship, the foundation really wants um, people that have potential to to change the world, even, I mean, we're not talking about like, you know, solving global warming, which is totally fine if you do wanna do that. Um, uh, or like cure cancer, which is totally fine with me as well. But um, that has the potential that can change their communities, their, 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 their living, uh, their, their cities, their, their social environment, uh, even if it's like one little step at a time. Um, and how, how they do this is by looking at the academic achievement because you do want to be a good student. Um, persistence is one of those keywords that you're going to have to use a lot in your applications. You need to show them that you, when you get knocked down, you get up again. Not, you know, no pun intended. Um, so try to, um, try to think about those times that life, situation, your environment, your the, even the social environment that we live in this, in this world have like literally knock you down and, and want to keep you down and, and, and show how you have persisted after that. Um, whether you are a US born, an immigrant, uh, somebody who doesn't feel comfortable with themselves, but then still persisted to move forward. Um, that is something that they want to see. Um, I personally talked a lot about my immigration uh, time, um, how uh, it was a different lifestyle, a different community, a different language, and how I had to become my parents' parents um, when I moved to the U.S. I mean, I even went to a um, uh, uh, traffic school with my dad because he didn't speak English and I had to like translate all the mistakes that he made in in the, the thing that he did. So um, little things like that uh, really tells you tells them who you are outside the school because believe me, you give a monkey enough training and enough, you know, uh, uh, positive reinforcements, they're gonna get an A in, in college. Don't get me wrong, um, but it will be totally different if the same monkey goes and joins groups and is a leader in the community. I know I'm being kind of a broad here, but I feel like you guys understand what I'm saying here is that anyone can get an A, but it's a whole different person who gets an A and on top of that, uh, wakes up early in the morning on a Saturday morning to do community service, to go to uh, workshops, to organize people, um, and they wanna they wanna be better. So uh, make sure you talk about that. That also is leadership. Leadership is a huge thing. 
uh, all those people in the room that are five Theta Kappa uh, members, and you guys already have like two steps ahead of everybody else. Um, if you are a Phi Theta Kappa member and on top of that, you're an active member, you're like a whole mile ahead of ahead of everybody else because, I mean, yes, I was a Phi Theta Kappa member, an active member, so yeah, I'm plugging in that. Um, but um, it, a lot of the a lot of the uh, the values that Phi Theta Kappa had um, when I was there is shared by Jack and Crew. And a lot of the service activities that I, I use for Phi Theta Kappa, I mentioned in my Jack and Crew Foundation scholarship. Um, and of course, financial need. Now, financial requirements. And again, you don't need to be broke to apply for this scholarship. But um, you will need to show every single financial document that you and your parents have. So be ready. At least in my year, we literally have to send everything on a FedEx package. And of course, my package was pretty thin because my family was broke. But um, even if you have a one stock from Tesla that you bought like 15 years ago and you still haven't sold it out, you need to show that. So every single thing, uh, make sure that you follow all the requirements once they once it requested from you. Um, so uh, let me see if they have any, the only, the only advice that I could tell you, um, that could, I could recommend is um, start early, work on your recommendation letters that we're gonna talk about a little bit and um, make sure you proofread everything. Um, there's nothing worse than a personal statement or a question answered uh, with good bad grammar. And I'm the king of bad grammar. So I'm, I'm telling you to proofread everything. Oh, so it is on the common transfer app. Okay, you were right, Vanessa. Me and Vanessa had a small talk a few, a few weeks ago about this and I was not sure about the common app. So um, a few years after we applied, or maybe even the year after I applied, they switched from having their own application system to doing it through the Common App. Um, they wanted it to be easier for you all to just access something that you will be accessing if you apply to private universities. So they now have it. Um, you have to log in through the Common App. You just look up Jack Kent Cook Foundation, and it should come up. Um, and then you'll just go through the application. Um, here, you will need to, again, as Alessandra said, they will ask for a lot of the financial aid that you have, your taxes, your parents' taxes. Um, so be prepared and work early and so that you can gather all that information. Um, you'll need two letters of recommendation. I remember getting one from my bio club professor um, and from, I think my chemistry professor as well. And then you'll have activities and honors, family, household information. You'll have some essays to write. And these are all, as you can see, very similar to act, like the actual application for transferring to a university. So it kind of helps again for it to overlap and for you to already have something written down maybe um, since you've already applied or will be applying. I'm not sure how, how um, much they overlap in terms of like deadlines, but you could probably recycle some of your essay material is what I'm saying, which is really nice. You most likely gonna have to apply for the Jack and Cook in mid fall. I think their deadline is like November this year or October, something like that. So go ahead and start now. Um, while I think transfer transfer deadlines are usually late December, middle of February. So um, yeah, I have something in my mind that I wanted to mention, hold on. Oh yes, so as somebody who has recently started working on or writing a, a recommendation letters, I'm gonna give you the same advice I was given back when I was, uh, you know, in your shoes. Make sure you email everybody that you want a recommendation letter from before you put them in the system, 
because you don't want them to find out that you have uh, put them as a recommendation letter writer before they accept. Make sure you ask them um, if they can and have the time to write a good, again, I repeat, good recommendation letter. Do not you say recommendation letter because anyone can copy and paste a template. A good recommendation letter will like activate something in the professor's mind saying, do I actually know this, this student? Um, and then um, because a good recommendation letter is worth like 10 basic ones. So uh, make sure you ask them. And on top of that, uh, make sure you send them a quick reminder of who you are, what you're planning to do, what schools you want to plan to apply to. If you have a CV or a resume or your transcripts handy, send them that. It always It's always good to have all that information. Do not try to um, do not try to use get recommendation letters from people that you think looks good on paper, like the president of the college. If you don't know the president of the college, you really need to have a, a good. Um, uh, you really want want to have a good relationship with the writers. Um, you know, like I personally seen a long time, holy moly. I know that one of my recommendation letter writers was my Phi Theta Kappa advisor and biology professor who was the same person. I can't remember who else was in my list, but I usually had professors that I go to their, I used to go to their uh, office hours, um, any, any extracurricular activities. Um, so they know who I am besides, you know, your student number and whether or not you got an A in the class. Um, so let so, me see. Um, yeah. Wait, oh yeah, um, wait, quick story. So actually I do remember who I asked. So I actually asked my math professor and um, so at the beginning of, it was calculus two. And at the beginning of this course, I literally failed like all the three quizzes right before the major exam. And I was so stressed and like concerned. And so I went into his office hours and I like, we ended up both crying during office hours. Like we really um, just, you know, um, he really helped me out and, and we were able to really talk and get to know each other. And then from then I was able to like really improve, find out like um, how to do better on his exams. And I ended up getting an A in his class. And he's the one who I asked for a letter of recommendation because he saw that change. He saw that uh, persistence and he was able to really talk about that. And I love what Alessandro said, which is when you ask for a letter of recommendation, ask if they can write a really good letter. Like, can you write a really good letter for me? Because if you don't add that, then you, it, it really makes a difference, actually. Because I, yeah, yeah. So make sure to add just those two little words when you ask. And um, and yeah, so just wanted to add that because I remembered. It's funny though, Vanessa mentioned that because I feel like some of my best professors that I had once I transferred to Cornell were not the professors that I got a good grade with right away. Were the professors who actually took the time to help me when I was failing. Um, like my developmental biology professor and my genetics professor. I mean, I wasn't doing that good in their classes until we sat down and we really talked about the subject. So use a side note, do not be concerned. Well, do not be alarmed or um, uh, disillusioned if you're not doing well in a class and you feel like you're not gonna do well at all until you actually talk to a professor, understand why you're not doing that good. Because sometimes, like in my case, it wasn't that I wasn't getting the, 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 the subject. The problem was that I wasn't really understanding how to answer the questions in the test. Um, because once I talked to them, it was obvious that I understood the subject. Um, it was just my way of answering questions. And talking about answering questions, let, let's just like, and knock some of these questions out. Um, can you still apply if you're a junior, if you're a junior in college? When you say junior in college, that's, that talks to me, that, that, that makes me feel like you're ready 
in a four-year college? And the answer might be not. Do, you, do they give the amount you need financially or is the scholarship a specific amount? So in my year was up to, up to $30,000. I think in Vanessa's year was up to 40, 35. 75, uh, wait, no, wait, 75 was the graduate. Uh, what did you say, 50, 50, 45? I, I don't know, 40. I covered everything. It's 55 anyway, now. now it covered everything, y'all. So I think up to now, um, Jubin, did you say something? It's 55 right now. So now it's up to 55, you know, blame inflation, blame, blame the war in Ukraine. Anyway, um, so it's up to, so you have, at the moment that you get the scholarship, at the moment that you go into, um, you're, you get accepted into school, there's going to be a lot of more paperwork between the financial aid office in your school, you and the financial aid officer from the foundation. There's gonna be a lot of paperwork between you, you three people and to show how much you actually need. They're gonna add all the, all, all the things that you need. They're gonna subtract all the scholarships that you have besides the Jack and Cook. And at the end of the day, they're gonna tell the foundation how much you need. And that should include tuition, room and board, um, if you live on campus, if you don't live on campus, then actually you can even put how much you will need if you don't live on campus, uh, how much you need for food, um, any travels, anything that they think, any books. And it should be, if it's up to $55,000, then you'll be fine. Now, why I'm saying this, because I had uh, have friends that were considered international students, and a lot of them were DACA students, so they were in, uh, considered international. So they didn't have any, any federal support. And in schools like Cornell, their tuition and room and board and everything was up to $60,000. Now, if you did the math, you can subtract 60,000 minus 30,000, it gives you another 30,000. So they still need another $30,000. So, and they found those $30,000 somewhere else. So the scholarship only gives you up to 55. Um, so I don't want, I, I like to be honest, I like to be clear, um, like they say in my country, no hairs in your tongue. Um, so uh, don't, tell, don't ask me why the hell is that phrase from, but um, the clear thing is that they're only gonna give you up to that money. If you need more than that, you might need to find another scholarship to add on to that, or hopefully financial aid, federal aid, can help you. Um, you can still apply if you transfer to, this, to university, but once you finish 12 credit hours, you're not eligible anymore. Um, I already answered that. I see that they will consider applications whose family income is up to $95,000 in my family may or may not be little over. So, I don't know if you guys actually can see all these questions. I'm just reading them out loud and, um, and I'm, sometimes I'm skipping the words, but about this $95,000 or more, the 100% chance that you're not gonna get this scholarship if, it's you, if, it's, if you do not apply. In other words, even if you think you're not gonna get it, apply anyway. It's a free school, it's free application. You just gonna have to like spend some time on it. And even though you think you may not get it because you know you earn a little too much money or you have a little bit below 3.5 GPA, or you think that Venus is in retrograde, whatever, you supply for it. And who knows, you may be, you may get it. Um, don't, don't, um, don't count, don't count on, on not getting it even before you apply for it. So that will be my only advice. Um, if you have any more questions about um, that specific that specific uh, topic, you can always email them. But my advice is apply anyway. Also, I would say I would say preach uh, preach uh, Alessandro because let somebody else tell you no. Don't tell yourself no. There's plenty of people in the world that want to stop you or whatever, but don't 
don't be don't you be that person to stop yourself and you know what's the worst thing they could tell you is no i mean yeah exactly um don't shoot yourself in the foot before you start the race um a personal anecdote um I wasn't going to apply for a grant um, when I was an undergrad because I thought they wouldn't get even to an undergrad. And my roommate walks in um, and he's like, are you applying for this grant? Because I am applying. I'm like, no, I'm not. And then I thought, wait, hold on. He's applying. If he's going to get it, I'm not going to get it. Like, I'm not going to let him get my scholarship or my grant. I know it's a very caveman kind of thinking, but the caveman came into me. So um, I apply and I got it and he did it. So you never know what's gonna happen. Um, so um, where do you go to help reviewing your application essays? That's a really good question. I don't know, Madeline, do you wanna answer that question? Do you guys have any programs coming up for application reviews or uh, writing workshops? jobs, anything, or maybe you might after this? I don't think we have any lined up yet. That does sound like a good idea, but um, I would just want to put a little plug in for um, people that are at a community college. You can always go to your Mesa Center. That's a good option. Um, a lot of times the most uh, community college do have a Mesa program, which is um, they'll have counselors available that you can go over your application with. Yeah, that's a really good point. And remember, the same people that review um, college applications review the Jack and Cook application. So don't be afraid that just because you're not going to a, a scholarship only you know, reviewer, that's gonna help you. Um, the, 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 they're all gonna be helpful anyway. Uh, uh, quickly, yeah. I see has added, I was gonna say that. So I went to, um, in the English department, they have a writing center. Um, so I went there and they were amazing help. So please go to your writing center and um, get your essays edited there. Um, that's what I did. Yeah. So if you're writing an essay, like it's kind of saying like, if I have cancer, I'm going to go see an oncologist. If you're going to write an essay, go to an English professor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't go to your friend or unless they're like English writers or people, because you could say, you know, I have like a, a, fa a really good friend of mine. He's a famous, in he's a famous writer, but I asked him to like edit something for me. And he's like, my friend, I write, I pay somebody else to edit me. And so, <laughs> so your, your English professors who write hundreds, of, who read and edit hundreds of papers a semester, they're probably the best resource. And I know, in California, I don't know about Florida or other places, but in California, every, by law, they have to have a writing center or, or, or they also call it a basic skills center. Those are the two keywords and they have it, they have to have it. So they would not get funding from the state if they don't have those facilities. And so you could go there and a lot of times they're prof uh, English professors who do you know a couple of hours a week there. Also, I'm pretty sure every single person that is applying and is transferring has taken English. So if you had an English professor that you liked, that's also a really good. They probably know your writing style a little bit. You probably have some sort of relationship with them. Um, use them as well. So I personally, so when I applied to the scholarship, I was in the U.S. for less than five years. So I had literally a kindergarten level of English, if you, if you want to think about it that way. So I went to everybody. I went to, and, and I made friends with a lot of really good English writers. Um, and I also went to, in, 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 I don't know if we have a non if we have non-California people in the group, but, um, in Florida, at least in my community college, they have the writing labs. So there were people specialized in writing. And actually, quick anecdote, the person in charge of that liked to write with a quail. No a quail, like quail style kind of, you know, um, pen. So he had to like, you know, um, uh, open the pen. And it was a whole thing. Anyway, um, it was pretty fun. 
so go to don't go only to one person either try to try to ask multiple people um what do you wish someone would tell you before you apply for this scholarship i'm sorry can i add something before yeah um okay so um also sort of a transition so for um again with the writing center i think the going to someone that was like heavy english major or like knows the english like someone that would be at an english center and editing essays they were the best help for me even for my med school application and um so then that brings me to my transition of so jack can't cook again i'll repeat also helps um you after you graduate from your undergraduate um degree and so for example um right now i got their graduate scholarship and so did alessandro um where they're paying up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars for medical school and they also helped um with like the mcat so apply um so getting the study materials for the mcat and i know they also help get study materials for like the gre and all those other great exams you need to take before applying to grad school and they just continue to provide that support so that's another reason why y'all should just apply and um i'll get it so yeah i just wanted to plug that in so it's this is one example of why the Jack and Co Foundation is awesome. It's because it's an evolving entity. In my year, and yes, again, I'm 90 years old, right? Um, they didn't have that help for um, study materials. So they obviously heard the complaints of people like me, and that helped people like Vanessa get that. So. Um, that's a good thing about the foundation. They really hear of the needs of, of the students, of the scholars. Um, in my time, it was only 50,000, and they noticed the $50,000 for any kind of degree is like literally a drop in a bucket. So um, they increased that as well. So all of that. Um, what did you wish someone would tell you before you apply for this scholarship to encourage you to reach for the stars? I mean, if nothing of what we're saying is telling you that, then I, I mean, no. Um, honestly, that question, I feel like I will need like a couple of tequila shots and, you know, um, some music in the background to tell you that. Um, nobody should tell you what you can or cannot do. You should literally be the only person who can tell you that. Um, I don't know about Vanessa, but myself, I have supportive parents telling me um, that I could do anything I wanted. But at the same time, I was the first one in uh, going to college, going to grad school in my family, at least in the US. So it was a bit, little bit of a paradox. But I feel like the best advice that I, would, I can tell you is focus on your goals. Um, the next few years, whether you go to grad school or not, whether you go to medical school or not, are going to be very harsh. There are going to be days that you're going to wish you can stay at home sleeping all day. Um, or if you are, if you're like me, you go away to college far, far away from family. And there are going to be times on those days that you wish you were with your mama and your, your papa, right? Um, but if you keep your eye on the goal, all of those sacrifices, all of those up and downs and downs and downs are gonna be worth it. Don't focus so much on, um, on what's happening, on the failure of that day, on the fact that your experiment didn't work, on the fact that you got a 85 instead of a 95 on a test. So I know you guys are nerds, aren't you? Just like me. Um, don't focus on those, focus on the goal. And um, just keep your eye on the goal. I feel that like that will be the best advice. Um, uh, the best advice I wish I was given will be do not distress so much about the present because your future is still pretty bright. I know, super cheesy, but it's true. I don't know, Vanessa, do you want to add something to that? Um, no, that was great, Alessandro. Um, I think. Um... 
Yeah, that's great. But let's, I know we have a ton of questions. So I'm going to actually move on. Oh, to yeah. My um, like, what, you, what is our time like? Sorry, I totally yeah. forgot to ask that question. Our meetings typically run until 12.30. Okay. All right. That sounds good. I, I need to head out at 12. So okay. um, Alessandro, maybe we can continue, but I have to leave at 12. Um, if y'all can share my email, that'd be great for any other questions that remain. And if anyone wants to reach out, um, I do see a question that says, do you think that they would prefer a STEM professor versus a humanities social science professor? So actually, again, because we have students worldwide in a variety of majors, we had music majors at like Johns Hopkins or what's the mate? There's like, we have music majors, we have ballet dancers, we have like so a variety of like people who are passionate, not like about various um, things. And so, yes, they would love you for you to get a letter of recommendation from someone who, as Alessandro said, um, you have a close connection with and can really speak to you and your persistence, your resilience and your passion. So, um, yeah, we have a wide range of majors, not, not a STEM-focused um, scholarship. So there is this question about, I am a continuing student. I have a lot of units in community college, but not a four-year. So I am not sure if I am eligible. I don't know if I am also confused about this question, but it sounds like you're asking if a few college credits from a four-year college will inhibit you, uh, or is the fact that you are maybe in your second act of, of life and you are a returning student. And, you know, I wish a lot of people are like that. So either way, my I answer think, yeah, would I be- think, I think they have, they like went to community college, stopped, and then came back. But apparently, all of their units are from a community college. I think, yeah. from what I've read on the website, you cannot have four year degrees. So you cannot be. Yeah. Uh, so if you've all if you've had three hundred units at community college, you you're fine. And also, I think that it is well the rule of thumb especially with medical school and other grad schools, is that if you took a, a class more than five years ago, the class is not um, uh, eligible anymore. Like if you took, a, you know, physiology in 2010 and you want to apply to medical school now, you might need to retake it. So my point here is most likely um, if you are a returning student for many years ago, and you're afraid that you are not eligible anymore, you might be now because those grades are not, they're not good anymore. Uh, if, you know, so if I were you, I will email um, the foundation and ask them. Um, again, if, there, if you ever have a question about, or if your answer is always, oh, maybe I'm not, most likely you are eligible. Um, what was your GPA? Oh my God, you don't ask the question. Shit, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> uh, my GPA in my community college, I think it was like a 3.8 something. Um, yeah, because I mostly had A's. Yes, I was a nerd, but then I had a C. And yes, look at that. And this is something I wanted to mention before. Even if you think that you got a D or a C at some point in your career and you don't think you're eligible anymore, Hey, I got a C in English one and I still got the scholarship. I still went to Cornell and so forth. So one bad grade doesn't make a bad student. So, um, but then in Cornell, that's where my GPA kind of like sunk. And we can talk about that more in another panel about transferring. But whenever you move to a new place, there's gonna be a moment of transition. And, you know, sometimes even if you are the biggest nerd like I was, there's going to be one one semester that's going to be really harsh. And that happened to me and that happens to a lot of people. I don't know, Vanessa, do you want to reveal your GPA? Um, so my GPA was, um, I think by the, when I applied, it was like a 3.9. Um, 
So what was I gonna say? Oh, in regards to community college to transfer. So again, I transferred to UC Berkeley and now in med school, but again, this is like, I'm only first two weeks in. Honestly, community college was so difficult and it was so challenging. It like super prepared me for like the stressors and everything at UC Berkeley. And even for now for a med school, like honestly, um, I'm very grateful for the hardships I had to go through in community college and how difficult the classes and like were for me there because they really truly prepared me and so um, and like all of the community college students I've met um, throughout this whole process, they I think we're all very like so mature and like can take on things are so like, I don't know, I think we're we're really great students um those of us that come from community college so um wait i think i went off on a tangent what was the question oh on gpa yeah. um and, and but yeah uh, just like a side tangent for when you transfer like don't be nervous you got this because community college really does prepare you i think um of course there's a transition but anyways that's a whole different topic um let's see what's another question i'll list on that you see um there was one question about what if you don't get to professors for your recommendation letters okay yeah because um due to the professor not knowing me well that one yeah yeah um, do you have any thoughts about that one so so immediately, first of all, if it's not a professor, do you know anyone else that you've worked with in outside organizations, volunteering, et cetera? Um, so, because of course you can ask anyone else. Um, they wanna see again, your leadership persistence. So anyone who could talk about that in regards to professors that might not know you well. Um, and if you do want a professor, I would suggest, um, maybe do start going to office hours. And also you can have professors who maybe like I did, so I didn't end up going to office hours, but who can see maybe a trend in um, your grades. Or if you do go to office hours one time, just open up to that, that one time, get advice from them. And then just say like, hey, this just came up. Would you be willing to do this? Even though um, you haven't like had a long-term relationship with them, I think it's better than than anything else that you might than any of like not having someone right um alessandro any other advice that you can add to that for someone they can ask mesa centers eops just any counselors you've talked to um i i think you got it um i think the main point is that recommendation letters do not have to be from professors per se um sure one professor will be good but Anyone else, any advisor, any outside uh, leader that knows you, I mean, a priest, a rabbi, a, a, a holy man, whoever you work with, you know, um, that knows you as uh, of, of who you are as a person could be as well a, a, good, a good fit for a recommendation letter. Um, remember, this is mostly for a scholarship that wants to know who you are as much as a student and as a, as a person. Now, if we were talking about grad school, that'll be different, a different answer. Um, there was one. So the interview process actually is a new thing that started, I know it started at least four years ago. I don't know if it started before that. Do you have to do interview, Vanessa? No, I actually did not have to do interviews. So I submitted the application uh, before winter and then, yeah, in the fall. And then they didn't notify me that I was a semifinalist until like January, February, and then, and then the, um, we got a, the finalist, but um, no interview. So I'm not sure I can't speak yeah. to that. But I was recently interviewed all last year for med school. So if y'all need interview <laughs> help, um, I'm glad to help. I think my email was shared and I'll do some practice interviews with you all if you'd like. Yeah, so in my year, we didn't even have a semifinalist. In my year, I think it was during the winter break or early after the winter break that I had to do this. Funny fact, I got sick while I was writing my, 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 my application because 
I was told that I could apply late. So I spent two weeks without a sleep uh, in my, in my, uh, in like in my undershirt writing in my home. So, and I got sick. Anyway. Um, can I, can I just add, can I, I, yeah. can I just add something about not knowing your professors at a community college? Um, I think like for medical school and all of these things, like if you're asking that question, um, instead of trying to find a solution of not having a professor write you a letter, ask yourself, what are the steps that I could do to uh, my professor get to know me? You are taking chemistry where you're in a lab with a professor for six hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, you see that professor probably more than you see your significant other or <laughs> other people. And so if you that person doesn't know you, and usually in a, in a community college, your chemistry labs are capped in California at 24 and now because of COVID I think it's 18 so um so I think like you know ask yourself that question you know like I personally don't have time to go to office hours my my schedule is pretty tight so but I've gotten to know a lot of professors really well to the point they've asked me to do TAing and other things but I don't like I don't have time to go to my professor's office hours a couple of them, because of COVID and everything, I've done Zoom. I've just emailed them and said, look, your office hours don't work. Can we Zoom for a quick minute? I have a couple of questions. They do that as well. And so, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, so by all means, like you have to like, so ask yourself, like, what are the steps you could take for your professor to get to know you? Um, and take those steps because you're going to need that for the scholarship. You're going to need it for medical school. Sometimes you need it for a job. If you want to do an e research internship, if you want to do, do a summer program, there's a host of things you need to have letters of recommendation from professors. And then somebody asked, you know, does it have to be a professor that you you have to do it? And the, the thing is always comes down to say, if medical school scholarship, if they say something that is recommended, they want you to have two letters from a professor and you say, well, I'm only going to give one and that should be enough. You have to look at it. There's few thousands of other people that are going to have two letters, two very strong letters of recommendation from their professors and you're not going to have it. And so you are putting yourself at that disadvantage. And so for applications and things, when they put things in there, it's not a suggestion. It's not they're trying to be hard, but that's what the expectation that they're putting for you and if you don't meet that expectation there's going to be thousands of other people that are going to meet that expectation and so when they say recommended suggested that means that it's an absolute because you're going to have a thousand other people like you know Vanessa or Madeline or Trinity that are going to meet that expectation and exceed it so like so this is not to like be harsh. It's not a harsh thing to say, but it's in the reality of how the world works. That's so amazing that you brought that up. Thank you so much. Like um, you have to put always like your best foot forward, I think in your classes, like just by you asking questions, the professor will notice that just by you, like um, just being interested in their class, they will notice that. And I think actually me being interested in like, for example, my biology class, my biology professor was the one who reached out to me and told me, hey, there's this internship. Do you want to do this without like me needing to do anything else? So like, just be present, ask questions, be curious, and they will see that too. And um, yeah, if you don't have time to go to office hours, these are ways you can build that rapport and build that relationship with professors. Ah, oh, such good advice. I mean, thanks for bringing that up. Also, um, I do have to head out. Um, I think you all do have my email. I don't know if Alessandro um, will continue, can continue for another. Um, I'm gonna stay here for a little bit more. Okay, but um, yeah, please reach out for interviews, any personal questions. I did um, see someone had a more like specific personal question. Um, so reach out and um, thank you. By Nessa. Uh, this is somebody also said this, and I'm going to say this is I've written letters of recommendation. So I have 
letters of recommendation from professor at CCs, but I keep asking him. So if somebody likes you and is willing to write you a good letter of recommendation, like they're willing to do it. And so I've written letters of recommendation for people. And I'm the kind of person if somebody asks me for a letter of recommendation. If I don't want to write one for them, I'd say, I, I'm not going to write one or I won't write a good one. And most people are pretty honest about that. If somebody really presses me, I'll, you know, but so they don't mind writing a letter. Um, most of the times that if they wrote you one good letter of recommendation, they may go in there and change it a little bit. So don't feel bad. Like they want you to be successful. They have a vested interest for you to be successful. And it's also bragging right for them. So like, don't feel bad. Like, you know, and it's not a lot of work to go and rework a good letter that they've written to, to meet that specific thing that you're applying for. And it's kind of like, it is it is their job in a sense that they went into education. Um, um, it is for their um, it is it is part of their job and they want to do it and they want you to be successful. So don't feel bad, like, you know, to do it. Like I know that uh Dr. Bailati is writes a letter of recommendation for uh students that work under him. And I have. And one thing that I can tell you is that don't feel bad because this is not forever. Um, just like anything else, you you your need for the recommendation letters from professors from your community college is going to stop. Um, because eventually you wanna meet somebody else that can take their place and will be more um um there there be more I don't want to say qualify, but better suited um to write a recommendation letter. So for example, I stopped asking my community college professors for my recommendation letter as soon as I became um acquainted with a professor at my four-year college. So uh just because you evolve. I mean, you know, two years after you finish community college, nobody's gonna expect you to continue the same relationship you had at your community college professor with your community college professor. They expect you to move on to a to to have a relationship with a professor at your four-year college and your grad school and then at your work and so forth and so forth. So don't feel bad if but for now you 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 use the same professors. They're going to change eventually. Um, well, there's one or oh, one big one here. One of my professors, an old fashioned, and refuses to use Come on app to submit letters of recommendation and will only directly email them to schools and a scholarship. Should I email the Jacking Foundation and see if it's okay? Oh, no option for this recommendation, or should I find someone else to fill her spot? As a recommender, she writes glowing recommendation le recommendations, and I would really like to include her because she knows me so well. That is a very interesting question. As far as I know, when I get emails, I mean, yeah, emails from universities or programs to write recommendation letters, they give me two options. They either give me the option of uploading the letter myself or literally copy and pasting it in a little square. A very, very few of them actually say, you can email us this letter. My best answer will be, you need to wait her up. We're in 2022 and she needs to get to the, with the ages. I mean, literally uploading a recommendation letter to a program is used as easy or as hard as uploading it to an email. I don't know what she will be, you know, saying this. But at the same time, um, she needs to understand that this is what you need. Email the foundation. I will feel that will be the best way if you don't think she will be willing to um, change her ways. And also the reason why, um, is different is because nowadays some scholarships and universities don't ask you for a recommendation letter anymore. They, they ask for answers to specific questions, like how do you know the student? How well do you know the student? 
how do you, the student you know perform in your class and those answers even though they could be given in a letter they go to the point faster in a in a quick short answer version i know it's not the best answer for today but uh, keep at it i'm sorry if i didn't if i answered that question very well um can you talk about study techniques? Can you talk about anything related to research experiences? How can we prepare for grad school? Well, that's a very deep question. Um, study techniques, each person has his own. It's a, it's a, it's a trial and error. Um, I have found out that I study the best when I have noises, music, movies in the background i know it sounds so totally bizarre um i studied better that way than in a complete silence i found out that i study better when there's like people around doing their own things like in a, in a library or a cafe um just because my brain works that way uh my best answer will be find the best one for you do not think that just because a professor with a PhD tells you what is their best way of doing it, it doesn't mean that that's gonna be the best way for you. Um, Research experiences. If you're a community college student right now and you still have a few semesters to go, try to find a lab to work at um, if you're into science, especially. Um, mainly because is going to help you when you go when you transfer. It's going to help you if you, you want to go into medical school, of course. Um, but at the same time, you don't have to. If you prefer to wait until you transfer to do research, wait until your second semester or second quarter, because you need to get um, acclimated to the new um, to the new environment. And again, this is a very important point. The new environment is going to be very different and it can shock you. So you want to start research with the right foot, not in the middle of like, you know, getting 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 settled in the new place. Um, I love research because it is not something that gives you a clear answer. Like A plus B doesn't necessarily equal C in research. It literally, you, you're, you're making up the answer as you go or you're finding out the answer as you go. That's what I love about science, about research, but at the same time, it can be very, very frustrating, not knowing the answer, not, not getting it right away. So not everybody who's in science is in research or is into research because research takes a specific type of skills that not everybody does. But doing at least one semester of research, one year of research will tell you if you are one of those people and knowing or not knowing that you are one of those people, it's very important because not everybody, not everybody that loves science loves research. So find out, do, do some research. And the last question about it was, oh, tell us about grad school. Let's put a pin on that. Let's focus on your finishing community college and transferring to a four-year college. Grad school is a whole different beast on its own. And I'm sure that if you worry about it right now, I'm sure you're gonna get ready by, by the time that you get there. So just breathe a little bit for now. Um, if you are working, oh, how did I hear about the Jack and Cook? Through the, the Five Theta Kappa um, group. I was a president, I was very involved and they talked about it all the time. Um, I noticed that somebody asked me asked about how to apply for Jack and uh, Phi Theta Kappa. Phi Theta Kappa is the honor society of a two-year college. So most two-year colleges have a chapter and it is honor society. So you have to have a minimum GPA of 3.5. Last time I checked, um, I maintain at 3.2 from now on, from then on. So um, they do have some requirements. But after that, it's a pretty easy way of, 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 of becoming a involved student, uh, honors student, without necessarily taking honors classes. If you are working, volunteering, chattering for a professional in the area of your future goals, they will surely get to know you 
well enough to write a good recommendation letter. Health fairies are a great place to find a place to gain chattering hours. I don't know if that's a question or a, or a comment, but I liked it anyway. Yes to all of that. Um, again, professors don't, um, recommendation letters don't have to come from professors. They just have to come, um, they just have to come from people that know you academically or professionally, even if it's volunteering. Anyway, I think I have answer most that are these essays the same every year my answer to that is i don't know it's been a long time since applied to it and it's been a long time since i've seen one so my rule of thumb will be yes that could be different from year to year but not too much um so yeah i don't know any other question guys i know we will get into the hour and a half of our meeting. Um, you guys have really good questions. I'm really uh, uh, amazed by um, everybody here today. Um, it, only through the questions, I'm amazed. So meeting you guys in person would be like literally mind blowing. So um, I'm I'm very excited about your futures and um, don't don't let anyone be your your roof. You know, just keep on going up. Anyway, any more questions? I think one of the questions was, the, are the essays the same every year? Yeah, I tried to answer that question by saying, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there was another one, letters of recommendation have to be at your school. Well, two of your professors have, you have to have two professors. I think they said that on their website and I literally just cut and pasted it from their website. So um, I don't know if you may have gone to another college and have letters from those professors. The other thing is the most important thing for letters of recommendation, they have to be recent. Like they can't yeah. be somebody from five years ago because it's like, I, like you're a totally different person five years ago. You could have been a total slacker five years ago and now you're, or now you're a total slacker and five years ago you were you know um you know five years ago you were a great student but now you're a slacker and that's so it have to be recent um certainly at a community college like if you've taken a teacher two years ago um that's that's okay but if it's somebody that you went to another community college five years ago and then now you're at another one i think that might be a little bit a little bit questionable. Um, yeah, I don't think, uh, I, I, the only thing is I would say, Dr. Uh, Belletti, is you went from a community college to an Ivy League school. Did you face any uh, disadvantages or were you looked at differently or discriminated coming from a JC or even now? I mean, from, I want to say yes, on the sense that I made myself be discriminated because I took an education class my first semester and I was surrounded by everybody who was there since, you know, freshman year. And we're talking about education. And once in a while, they will say something that will make me really, really want to scream, dudes, but you were advantaged. You know, like, dude, you went to like a, an academy instead of like high school, an inner city high school. So I kind of like sometimes um, isolated myself by making those comments. Um, used to remind them that all, not everybody um, came from the same background, came from the same place, you know? Um, so, and, and every time I, I would like, raise my hands, I would see people like rolling their eyes, being like, oh my God, here comes again. So, but those were, were the only moments. Um, no, and it wasn't because they didn't think I was up to it or was good enough or smart enough. It was just because they got tired of being reminded of that, you know? And I feel like that's gonna happen anywhere. Um, but besides that, I don't think 
I got um, discriminated from coming from, from a community college all that much um, because my community college, and I'm sure many of many community college really prepare you to, to, to meet those challenges. Um, and if you're not, if you don't feel ready for it, I feel like they at least prepare you to know how to not to ask questions, to, uh, to, to ask for help. Um, and that was my community college. My community college also, um, you know, showed me that it was okay to tell professors, wait, 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 you know, go back or meet them in a 101. So um, that was very helpful for me. Um, I'm not gonna tell you that I didn't have any issues transferring um, because I did, um, but it wasn't because I was coming from a community college. I feel it was because of who I was. Um, I, I know my mama tells me that I'm perfect, but I'm not, I'm not perfect. So, um, you know, little things always happen. Um, was one more thing. Ask for help. Always ask for help. Um, always ask questions, uh, even if you don't want to be that person. I was always that person. I, I can tell you I have so many now good friends who told me, Alessandro, when I first met you, you were asking questions and I wanted to hit your face. They didn't, but we became friends and whatever, I don't care. Um, because it was I was asking the questions for me. I wasn't answering the questions to please anyone. Um, so uh, ask questions, it's always good. Um, and know your limits, know that you can, you can overcome your limits, but know your limits. People more than 30 years that are in community college can apply to this scholarship, or do you know any other scholarship program that I said people older than 30 years old? You can apply to the scholarship even if you're 80. I mean, there's no time limit for this scholarship or age limit. Like I mentioned before, I have a friend who now is in her 70s who has a PhD and she went to community college first. She got the scholarship um, to transfer and all of that. So, and when she did that, she was in her. I want to say late 50s, early 60s. Anyway, my point is, no, there is a time limit, there is an age limit. Every limit, every requirement that the scholarship has, has to be with education, not with your age or marital status or sexual orientation or nationality or lack of nationality, none of that. The scholarship doesn't care about any of that. It cares about who you are as a person. Do you know any program that supports the students in a university like this program? I do not know if I understand that question. Do you know any program that supports the students? In yeah, so there is. There is like every university has a scholarship office, and you could like they post scholarships. Uh, there's a but there's a Sholly. That's another good website that I found um, that has scholarships and so scholarships are out there and also um yeah so like Shali's a really good one there's a host of other ones but um i don't know are there any other scholarships that you received when you were so i don't know if the person who asked the question was talking about scholarships or programs i know there is a lot of programs in the trio um umbrella t-r-i-o uh, TRIO is a national federal funded programs that are everywhere, that are from community college to grad schools. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was I was named, you know, Florida Alumni of the Year, something like that, for the TRIO program. But anyway, um, look for that. Um, maybe your, your school, either community college or uh, your community college or uh, four-year college will have a program that will help you. Um, I am a current UC Davis student, but I want to have a support system like the, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it is harder. We, the, 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 the foundation being a star 
with the aim of having the support system. It just happened to be that way. Um, my best answer will be the TRIO program, look for TRIO programs. Um, but also, who knows, maybe this program, the uh, pre-med CC could be that the support system that you're looking for of like-minded people that want to, um, they wanna, they wanna succeed in their academic endeavors. And, you know, um, maybe you can. So maybe it's something to think about as a member of the program or maybe as one of the presidents or chairs, who knows? I put some stuff in the chat too, but UC Davis. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. Then everybody seems to be, um, nobody else has questions. So, I don't have any uh, questions. What about Madeline and uh, Trinity? I just wish I had known about the scholarship when I was still at community college. It sounds like an amazing, amazing opportunity and program. Yeah, it, it, it is. Um, but what, what, one thing that I want you guys to, to think about, you don't need to be in this program or have this scholarship to be a successful person. It's a hell, don't get me wrong. So even if you are one of the few people who apply and don't get it, do not get discouraged. Um, my success story, Madeline's success story, Trinity's success story, Jobin's success story doesn't have to be your success story. You write your own success story. We just give you our advice and our um, uh, uh, examples, use as a, a, as a as a model, but it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily follow step by step, even Vanessa's success story. So don't be discouraged um, about, you know, little things on the way. Um, like I mentioned before, focus on your goal. Remember what the goal is, even on your darkest days, focusing on your goal is gonna help you through that. And my last thing that I can say is, you know, um, uh, be mindful of, of, of you, of your needs, of your happiness, and I'm sure you're gonna do great things in the future. So uh, with that, I'm so glad I was able to come, come here today, even if it's virtually, maybe next time we can meet in person. Um, the people, organize, the organizers have my contact information but you literally can use Google me with my name. I'm, there's very few Alessandro Bailetes in the world. You can find me online on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. I don't do much social media anymore, but if you ever need anything, let me know.